So we started with this lovely book. Should we all do the book flash? Because we started doing that and it's really nice. Yay! <laughs> it's like a club, isn't it? Members club or something. <laughs> you don't have to have the book. But we started with uh, the book at the front. You're lucky because if I read a book on my own, I start anywhere. But we started at the front and we're talking about right understanding, which is basically right view of the Eightfold Noble Path. So the Buddha is defining that in various ways. And uh, so far we've touched upon the two kinds of right view, one which is subject to the, here is translated as influxes. You could also say outflowings, the asoas, and one which is free from those asoas. In other words, the right view before we become um, a noble person, before we've really broken through to full right view, and the kind of right view that happens when uh, we have had that kind of wisdom into the Four Noble Truths. So there are two different levels, and of course, there's everything in between as well. So, you know, like everything in the path, it's a gradual process of refining and deepening our wisdom and our understanding uh, through our practice. And then we talked about right view from the perspective of defining what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. So this is the first one actually in the Samaditi Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya number nine. And it goes through a lot of others as well, how we can define right view in various ways. But of course, starting with unwholesome and wholesome is very helpful because if we're looking at where our speech, action and, and mental activity is coming from, the root of um, everything we do in this world, we can already determine to some extent whether that's going to actually have beneficial um, results for ourselves and others, whether it's going to lead to more happiness and, uh, and well-being and a freedom from suffering in the world or not. So a lot of it is about where we're coming from. And then, of course, he's going into the actual um, conduct. So going through the precepts, what we'd traditionally understand as some of the precepts, our speech, our actions, how trustworthy we are, how harmless we are, right? Because that's what really underpins all of these precepts. It's a, a way of living that's non-harming ourselves and others. And then we talked about karma last week. We talked about uh, the arising of karma, how it should be understood, how it ceases and the way leading to cessation. So in the same format that the Buddha talks about the Four Noble Truths. And the diversity of karma, um, how beings are born in various realms according to their actions in this life, according to their volitional actions in this life. Um, and then how beings fare according to their karma. I had some homework from that actually. I wonder if anybody did it, <laughs> but you forgot. Did you forget? <laughs> no, some of you didn't. So you had to speak. So I said um, that you might like to find out what was the third uh, crack in the egg when the Buddha broke through to full enlightenment. Do you remember? So at the end of the one about beings fair according to their karma, the Buddha said that, um, so let's have a look. So, So first of all, he, he purifies the divine eye and sees the beings passing away and being reborn, inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. And I understood how beings fare in accordance with their karma. I'll just skip it a bit. And then he saw beings passing away and re being reborn. And Oh, that's the same, sorry. Yes, that's a repetition. So he understood how beings fare according to their karma. Is that right? Ooh, I'm getting mixed up now. Uh, hmm, I don't understand why that's the second one. Anyway, there's two there, basically understanding how people are being reborn according to their actions in this life. And then there was another one. So anybody, anybody found that one? No? Anyone? <laughs> you can write it in the box. Otherwise, I'll give you the same homework for next week. 
<laughs> okay, so that's a, a very brief summary of what we've been doing so far. And this week, we are on to a sutta from the Anguttara number 365. And it's called When You Know For Yourselves. So in this sutta, which is quite a famous sutta, especially in um, more secular circles, actually, um, the Buddha's talking to the Kalamas. Sometimes people know this sutta as the Kalama Sutta. And he's giving them some guidelines, a framework to understand which teachings might be worth taking up and examining and exploring, practicing further, and which ones should be abandoned. So perhaps I'll just get straight into it and start to read this because there's a couple of suttas and if we do get through it, that's almost three pages, we finish this chapter. So I'll start to read and I will pause probably part way through to see if there's any comments or questions, yeah? Especially practical things that you might like to bring up. So, when you know for yourselves, Anguttara 365, the Kalamas of Kesaputta approached the Blessed One and said to him, Bhante, there are some aesthetics and Brahmins who come to Kesaputta. They explain and elucidate their own doctrines but they disparage, denigrate, deride, and denounce the doctrines of others. But then some other ascetics and Brahmins come to Kesaputta, and they too explain and elucidate their own doctrines, but disparage, denigrate, deride, and denounce the doctrines of others. We are perplexed and in doubt, Bhante, Bhante means venerable, as to which of these good ascetics speak truth and which speak falsehood. So everyone's coming through, and this was the tradition in ancient India that you know there were so many kinds of recluses and Brahmins and ascetics. Perhaps some had teachers, others may not have had teachers. And everybody of course thinks that their doctrine, their understanding is the correct one. So they're coming in and uh, saying, you know, listen to me, don't listen to the others. And yet the others are saying perhaps complete opposite things and, and also saying that they're correct. So because of that, there's a lot of confusion and they want to understand you know, how they can actually understand um, who, who is speaking truth and who is speaking falsehood. So then the Buddha answers, it's fitting for you to be perplexed, Kalamas. It's fitting for you to be in doubt. Doubt has arisen in you about a perplexing matter. And then he gives them some guidelines. Come Kalamas, do not go by oral tradition by lineage of teaching, by hearsay, by a collection of scriptures, by logical reasoning, by infer inferential reasoning, by reasoned cogitation, by the acceptance of a view after pondering it, by the seeming competence of a speaker, or because you think this aesthetic is our guru, but when, Kalamas, you know for yourself, these things are unwholesome, these things are blameworthy, these things are censured by the wise, these things, if accepted and undertaken, lead to harm and suffering, then you should abandon them. So that's quite interesting. I think most of you might be familiar with that passage, but um, just reading it now, I notice how the first list that he gives there of things not to follow are all around mere intellect, mere intellectual knowledge, or just believing things because other people have believed them in the past. Even accepting a view after pondering, you know, or because we think this aesthetic is our guru. But then he's saying, when well, we know for ourselves, so then we're moving into some kind of experiential understanding of the path and the actual effects of those views that we hold. So it's really not so important even, I would say, as to what is right or wrong, but where it's leading again, okay? Because the Buddha is only interested in leading us away from harm and suffering. So then he goes further and says, what do you think, Kalamas? When greed, hatred and delusion arise in a person, is it for their welfare or their harm? For their harm, Bante. Kalamas, one overcome by greed, hatred, and delusion, with a mind obsessed by them, destroys life, 
takes what is not given, transgresses with another's spouse and speaks falsehood and they encourage others to do likewise. Will that lead to their harm and suffering for a long time? And then they say, yes, Bante. So this is the reason that greed, hatred and delusion are so destructive because they lead us to do all kinds of unskillful things um, that harm other people. And that leads to even more suffering. So we really get into a vicious cycle. <clears throat> Are there any questions so far or any comments that anyone would like to make about anything in this sutta? Not so far, so I'll continue. What do you think? Are these things wholesome or unwholesome? Unwholesome, Bante. Blameworthy or blameless? Blameworthy, Bante. Censured or praised by the wise? Censured by the wise, Bante. Accepted and undertaken, do they lead to harm and suffering or not? Or how do you take it? Accepted and undertaken, these things lead to harm and suffering. So we take it. So you see the Buddha's questions seem very straightforward because they're pretty much yes or no answers. But I think the fact he frames his questions that way shows that they're the really important matters to actually ask about. You know, not even will it make you happy to follow this view or does it inspire you or, you know, does it ring true for you? But is it actually going to lead to wholesome behavior? And then the other interesting thing there is that one of the criteria is, is it censured or praised by the wise? Which is a bit different, isn't it? And I think that again points to the qualities of, and the purpose of spiritual friendship, actually having people in our lives that are wise, being able to recognize them. And of course, the best way to recognize them is by their conduct, right? Again, not through what they say or whether they're following a lineage or speaking from tradition, but by their conduct. And that, you know, we want to emulate those kind of people. So if those kind of people are praising certain behaviors and those kind of people clearly show the benefits of the way they practice and the views that they hold, then that gives us some confidence that if we practice in a similar way, we might also uh, experience the same kind of qualities, develop similar qualities in our heart. And that was certainly one of the things that attracted me to all of my teachers. You know, I wanted to know not only whether what they were saying made sense, but how did it manifest in them? Could I see anything special, anything different in them? Or were they just as angry, just as arrogant and egotistical as anyone else? You know, had they walked that bit further than me or perhaps a lot further than me? And was it something I could really emulate and aspire to be? You know? And uh, I was saying to somebody earlier today that one of the things that that attracted me to Ajahn Brahm as a teacher and gave me very deep confidence was that not only did he teach incredibly deep Dhamma that went straight to my heart, I also heard very early on from his early Reigns talks that he was teaching to thousands of people and really um, not about the numbers but the intensity of his service, you know, traveling from here to there and just giving. And I thought, wow, this to me is a real... Um, is something to really take inspiration from that not only has that person realized very deep peace, you know, and is able to explain it to others, but they actually um, spend their life then trying to benefit others through that knowledge, through that wisdom. So I guess, you know, in that sense, it, it matters to me, you know, it matters to me, for example, if my life is on the right track, I'll check it out with my teacher. And if he would sort of censure or blame me for something, then I would pull myself into line, you know. But at the same time, if I say, oh, you know, I've done this thing or that thing, and he says, oh, yeah, good, you know, keep going that way, then it gives me confidence that I'm on the right path. So, so it's an interesting one that they say this, because, of course, it can, we can be mistaken, right? We can think someone's wiser than they really are. And again, I think a very good criteria is not how famous they are, not how renowned they are, how senior, how much gravitas they have, but how is their conduct? You know, is there any reason to doubt them? Um, 
in some traditions, unfortunately, a lot seems to happen in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, but it's nothing against that teaching necessarily, but something perhaps about the hierarchies there I mean that sometimes there are abuses of power and you know sexual misconduct and then a lot of attempt to cover it up and this is really incredible sometimes to me I mean very distressing and concerning but just incredible the lengths that people will go to to try to justify that because they've already assumed the person's wise so then they try to interpret their behavior in the context of oh it must have been wise because the person's wise <laughs> right rather than okay if they're having this kind of conduct they can't be quite so wise as I thought because again the Buddha's always pointing to where we're coming from if it's coming from greed hatred and delusion right I mean if they're performing misconduct it must be coming from greed hatred and delusion you can't have a motive of kindness compassion and non-harm and renunciation right of sexuality sensuality and then commit adultery that's not possible it's not possible. So we know that something's wrong at the root level there. And it's quite interesting that he um, includes that one, I think. Because, yeah, even for us, we, we can't be 100% sure. We might do something we think is beneficial, we think is blameworthy, and later we might find that, mm, even though I had a good intention, I could have put it a bit more skillfully, or I could have chosen my timing a bit better and not written an email when I was still agitated. <laughs> right. So there's a few reflections. Um, and then the Buddha repeats that. Shall I go through it again? Because the repetition can help for it to sink in and then we can have some comments and questions after that. So then he says, thus Kalamas, when we say come Kalamas, do not go by oral tradition. Oh, I'll repeat the whole thing. By lineage of teaching, by hearsay, by a collection of scriptures, by logical reasoning, by inferential reasoning, by reasoned cogitation, by the acceptance of a view after pondering it, by the seeming competence of a speaker, or because you think this ascetic is our guru. But when, Kalam, as you know for yourself, these things are unwholesome, these things are blameworthy, these things are to be censured by the wise. If accepted and undertaken, they lead to harm and suffering, then you should abandon them. It is because of this that it was said. Okay. Come Kalamas, do not go by oral tradition. And then it summarizes, or because you think this ascetic is our guru. But when you know for yourselves, these things are wholesome. These things are blameless. These things are praised by the wise. These things, if accepted and undertaken, lead to welfare and happiness. Then you should live in accordance with them. Be worth making a list, wouldn't it? So they should be wholesome, blameless, praised by the wise and lead to the welfare and happiness. What do you think, Kalamas, when a person is without greed, hatred and delusion? Is it for their welfare or their harm? For their welfare, Bhante. Kalamas, a person not overcome by greed, hatred and delusion, whose mind is not obsessed by them, does not destroy life, take what is not given, transgress with another's spouse or partner or speak falsehood, nor do they encourage others to do likewise. Will that lead to their welfare and happiness for a long time? Yes, Bante. And what do you think, Kalamas? Are these things wholesome or unwholesome? Wholesome, Bante. Blameworthy or blameless? Blameless, Bante. Censured or pra praised by the wise? Praised by the wise, Bante. Accepted and undertaken, do they lead to the welfare and happiness or not? How do you take it? Accepted and undertaken, these things lead to welfare and happiness, so we take it. Thus, Kalamas, when we say, come, do not go by oral tradition, etc., but when you know for yourselves these things are wholesome, these things are blameless, these things are praised by the wise, 
these things have accepted and undertaken lead to welfare and happiness, then you should live in accordance with them. It is because of this that, that this was said. Okay, so that's that little excerpt from that sutta. So when we're not overcome by greed, hatred and delusion, our mind is not obsessed by them. We don't destroy life, take what's not given, break our precepts around sexuality and um, what's the word, commitment. We don't speak falsehood and nor do we encourage others to do likewise. So that's interesting because he's not only talking about what we do, but the kind of influence again that we have on others. Yeah, so it's not always enough just to abstain, but it's also part of the practice to actively encourage others to do good, right? And to be very careful not to encourage others to, to do wrong. Yeah, somebody asked Ajahn Brahmali today in a talk that I listened to, a really fantastic talk that he gave at Damaloka. And he um, was answering some of the questions of the moment, you know, about peaceful protests in Myanmar and how far monastics should get involved, whether they should encourage others to, you know, protest and be peaceful or whether the role of violence can ever be a helpful thing. Like, is there ever any justification for violence? Um, and also he was saying that, uh, that he was talking about like social justice issues, the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter. And it was really beautiful to hear him put it in the framework of, of the path of the practice. Um, yeah, and he was also saying about encouraging, you know, encouraging others to, to do likewise and um, being an example for each other. You know, so, so as a monastic, you have a duty, right, to always uh, encourage one to abstain from violence, but also to encourage one to speak up for what's right and taking the guidelines of the Buddha and the guidelines of knowing that we all desire happiness and we all, um, you know, recoil from pain, we should empathize and, and try to work for equity and for fairness and justice in this world whilst keeping in mind that still we're going to suffer from the inevitable suffering inherent in being a human being. Yeah. And, and to take the Buddha's teachings, not only in applying to those things, but also as a way out of all of that completely, as a way to transcend all suffering completely. Yeah. First of all, at the psychological level and then at the existential level by actually taking us out of samsara altogether. So it was a very beautiful talk and I would very much recommend it for anyone here because I think it's lovely when the sila and the ethics starts to move into wholesome action and not just okay well I'm not killing you know but I'm watching everyone else get killed <laughs> and but it's okay because I'm doing my bit by not engaging but sometimes we can be almost colluding right by keeping a silence we can be colluding um or for example, by saying, oh, I'm not racist, you know, which I have to confess, I used to think I was very sure I'm not racist. I've lived all over the place. I've got friends from every culture. I actually don't quite like my own kind of history with colonization and, you know, wouldn't want to live in a small white town. So I used to think that. And now, of course, I realize that by not acknowledging my own privilege and entitlement, that just keeps systems of power in place. And that is a lack of empathy for those that don't live under those same, in, with that same privilege that I have, you know. And that's a privilege in one way. And then, of course, in another way, being female is, uh, is less of a privilege in terms of gender, but more of a privilege than somebody who might be non-binary or, or transgender. So I think it's really wonderful when we start to understand that our role in ethics is also to be an ally and to put ourselves in other shoes, you know, as far far as we can right as far as we can I think that starts with listening to each other really listening seeking out the perspective of people with a different um, experience a different conditioning in their life mm. so yeah so that is that sort of and I would really love to hear anything you would like to comment or or feed back around that um, whether those guidelines seem helpful for you or whatever it is. So I think we have someone. Yes, I will unmute uh, Ricardo. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So um, just a quick question, because there were a couple of references to the wise, whom I guess would be Extreme Winners Plus, and also to delusion, which kind of does require some level of you know, understanding. Mm. While, of course, in terms of Sila, of course, that is the basis, but uh, you know, that is kind of more, that's easier to understand. Yeah. So, yeah, I would like to understand better, you know, how we can use these guidelines um, to kind of use them in real life, but at the same time, since at least I am not the extreme winner yet, so, you know, how can we yeah, yeah. use them in a yeah. reasonable way? Thank you. Yeah, great. Um, I mean, as far as a wise person goes, I think you might be right there because in the Buddha's day, there may have been quite a lot of stream winners and a lot of actually enlightened people. Um, so this is why it's interesting that the Buddha refers to that because obviously the Kalamas are not quite sure who's wise and who's not. But I think the guidelines he gives there about conduct, about you know um, where we're coming from and how we're behaving towards others, in particular, through our virtue, is also an indicator of what we might be looking for in a wise person. So the wise person doesn't necessarily have to be a stream winner because we can't really know, to be quite honest, unless we have very strong faith and are very close to a teacher who may, who we may know about, it's rare to have that kind of, you know, that kind of connection. Um, even amongst monastics, most people don't want to disclose too much. Um, but I think it's giving good guidelines for us to understand how to identify someone who has some wisdom. And it's a really great question about delusion, because you're quite right, it's such a deep rooted, it's the deepest rooted of all the, um, can you even call it a defilement? It's a root, right? It's a root defilement. Um, it's the start of Paticca Samapada, it's the reason that we're here. So it comes even before craving and aversion, right? We crave because we don't understand that things are actually impermanent, that actually what we're craving for is nothing but suffering, different kinds of suffering. And that basically there's no one there to crave. There's no one there to receive the object of our craving. So because of this, we, we are craving and the same with aversion, right? We actually think this something there to be angry with. We don't see it as just changing phenomena. <laughs> and so it's it's difficult. It's like, where do we start? Do we start at the level of delusion or do we start you know, with our basic conduct in daily life? But I think seen in the context of the whole training, the seal is a great place to start because even with a little bit of restraint, we can usually manage to um, prevent ourselves from doing and inflicting gross harm on ourselves and others. And I do believe, I mean, I think I'm very grateful <laughs> that as a human being, we, we have almost like an instinctive knowledge of what's right and wrong by the effect that it creates in our heart. Like we know when we've been unkind and we feel some kind of, oop, that didn't sit well. Like I'm, I'm feeling like I should apologize now. That's not my best. That's not what I really wanna be putting forward in this world. We have that kind of knowledge, especially, you know, if we've come to this path, it shows we've got some kind of um, conscience there. Um, and yeah, and as we meditate, we become more sensitive to the effects of our conduct. So we start to restrain the defilements at that point. And we restrain them through the practice then, through sense restraint, so also virtue at the mental level and then through overcoming the hindrances in deeper meditation. And that's the point where we start getting, chipping away at the root of delusion because delusion is fed by the five hindrances. This is a thing like the Buddha never said that there's an actual cause as such because you can't really trace it back. But he did say that delusion has nourishment and that is those five hindrances. So it's like they circle around each other and build each other up. So we start by restraining at the level of body and speech and then mind, and then further refining um, the purity of our mind through meditation. And whenever we can sort of starve that delusion for a while, our mind is much clearer. We're much more able to see things as they really are. So I think this is how it sort of relates. Um, but I also think the sila is a majorly important part of the practice. And again, I'm very inspired by Ajahn Brahmali on this because 
he really took years to build an incredibly strong foundation of CELO and a lot of sense restraint and talks about that for 70% of his talks, 70% of his retreat time. It's all about right view, CELA, 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 virtue, 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 because they're the really gross defilements that will actually prevent us from being able to see things more deeply. As long as we're maintaining reasonable sila, five precepts, and also in their positive aspects, you know, caring, compassion, motivation of loving kindness, non-harm, then we're okay. We're, we've, we've got what it takes. We've got what it takes. So that's the good news. <laughs> yeah. Diana also has a question. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Venerable Chanda. Hello, Diana. Um, I just, I have some comments about this little excerpt of the sutta. Um, it, it starts off where the, the bhikkhus are having doubts about what should we believe or how do we know um, if we should believe mm. these other teachers or those other teachers, everybody says they're telling right. the <clears throat> And the Buddha says, well, to know for yourself if a teaching is correct, you know, here's what you should judge it on, wholesome or unwholesome, blameless or blameworthy, censured or praised by the wise, leading to welfare and happiness. And then he goes on to give his own teaching. Mm -hmm. to, if your mind is overcome by greed, hate, or delusion, um, and then you break these other silas, what happens? Does it meet those criteria? So yeah. without saying, here's my teaching, check it out. He just <laughs> goes right into it, um, which is the second noble truth, the cause of suffering, the things that he mentions. And I was just reminded of how last week we talked quite a bit about killing of insects, you know, and I, I that came up in our class or our discussion group last week. And I think that's a place where people tend to get stuck in sila. Like, <clears throat> I mean, it's important, but these other things are really important too. Um, mm. Like speaking truthfully, lying is so common in our culture and just little white lies and they they all create these kind of dukkhas in us and you know not just deceiving the other person but what we have to generate why are we lying like what are we hiding what do we mm. and um just the way he starts by saying mind overcome or obsessed by greed hate and delusion reminded me also of Ajahn Brahmali's talk this morning well, it was this morning for me um, because it started off by talking about how do we deal with these horrible things going on in the world and we tend to kind of obsess about it. The mind wants to go to some terrible thing that's happening, whether it's Myanmar or COVID or social justice issues, and we really get wrapped in it and that can also lead to these yeah. other so i just kind of it was really useful for me to hear that this morning and then to mm -hmm. be talking about the sutta and just to see how it kind of links mm -hmm. together yeah to keep mind on on wholesome not that we shouldn't think about or fight for justice but yeah yeah, yeah, to keep that balance in a sense, right, to make sure we're not allowing what starts off maybe as compassion to move into anger and hatred and frustration or despair. And then, of course, we wear ourselves out and, yeah, we're not able to have the clear discernment enough to make uh, the right choices as to how we might be able to help. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't hear you anymore. I think you muted again. Yeah, it really draws us in. Um, mm. We have that internet available to go and 
yeah. what's happening now well what's happening now what about now uh, yes 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 and it's always going to be the bad news unfortunately yeah 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 thanks for that I, I like the way you noticed how the Buddha very skillfully put in his teaching because I'm so used to the Dhamma now that it looks like oh it's not anybody's teaching it's just law, the law of nature right but in a sense that's what he's teaching and he did it in such a way that yes I didn't really notice that he did that <laughs> yeah and and at quite a deep level going back to the roots of these things mm. yeah so I'll um, come to... Tom has a question. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Hi, I'm Jenny, actually. I've got my husband's Zoom account so, <laughs> to stop that confusion. My question is this, right? So uh, now being middle-aged, I've accepted that most teachers are going to have, you know, many flaws, like even people who are pretty senior. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I've struggled with a bit in the sense that, uh, so you're sort of saying, uh, let me put this right, that you find things out for yourself, right? But you also want role models and people to emulate, but then you're gonna get a bit stuck because those people you're trying to emulate often, you know, sometimes shock you or disappoint you or whatever. And I guess I've been encouraged to be in, you know, empathetic about that in the past, but then it hasn't really sat right with me. You know, yeah. I haven't been able to really accept all of those things and then carry on with that person being my teacher but equally I haven't felt comfortable um sort of you know talking about that because of the Buddhist tradition of, of um mm. respect and um you know listening and being compassionate and actually mm. you know yourself being kind of with fault so I guess my question is this is that how do you find how do you when do you leave it so this is going to be too complicated. How do you choose a teacher, really? Because you can't mm. ask for perfection, right. and but and but you can't always find things out for yourself because if you're not at that point where you really can see things clearly. So yes, I guess I've thrown a few people out with the bathwater, you know, in the past, and been like, yeah. well, they're obviously not wise. But yeah. equally, you have to know when to move on as well, don't you? So that's sure. my question to you. Okay, wow, big one, big one. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I guess at a very basic level, I would say if somebody's not keeping the sealer, the, the virtue, even the basic virtue, for me, they wouldn't be much of a teacher. I could, it doesn't mean I couldn't learn from them and I couldn't have learned from them in the past. But if I would find over time that their sealer was actually lacking in some way, even, you know, perhaps not even as strong as my own, and obviously I'm a non, so I have pretty good CeeLo, right? <laughs> then then, <laughs> then <laughs> I would, uh, <laughs> but not perfect, right? None of us are perfect. So personally, I want somebody that I can see that there's something I can learn from. And if their CeeLo is not up to scratch, then I doubt that their practice is going that deep, no matter how much wisdom they have to offer. Now that might not matter if I'm just going to a Dhamma talk, if I don't have a personal relationship with that person, I just, you know, there's some things they might be able to teach me because they, the way they explain things or the way that they practice might be inspiring in different ways. But I guess it would be a matter of how close I would get to that person and how much trust I could have, because really it's the sealer that gives us trust in others, isn't it? It's the virtue that makes us trustworthy. Even animals notice that even animals feel safe when people they know are harmless they know are, are good people there's a good energy there you know um so that's one thing and I don't think it's too much to ask that from any kind of spiritual teacher in fact I think that should be the basic I really do it doesn't mean if they do a little white lie once then you just kind of throw them away but I would ask them about it I mean with my teacher I ask him about anything that I'm doubtful about and I mean it's never around his sealer you know but it might be around little things tiny things like that bother me that I just want to flag you know for example he might just keep on mentioning certain monks and he never might mention a nun and then it's like oh actually that makes me feel like I don't matter so much if I don't hear myself represented I'll tell him that you know and I'll see what the response is now if he would respond kind of irritated and oh these women you know I wouldn't feel so comfortable but do you see what I mean I mean it's just 
how deeply can you dig with somebody I guess and and after a while you start to get a sense of of their depth of character of their um, compassion and and yeah you start to feel very safe with such beings um, even though they're not perfect as in human beings because all of us say clumsy things or do things that we don't mean to hurt someone but we hurt someone so you never be able to avoid that the other thing I'd like to say is that there aren't that many people around who've really understood the Dhamma to a deep level. And I think for that reason, I really respect, again, Ajahn Brahmali, who's coming up in this talk quite a bit today, um, because he's a wonderful teacher, but his, and he's been very close to Ajahn Brahm from the time he, you know, moved to Perth. He's been training with him for like 24 years, I think, uh, since 94, is that 24 years? It's quite a long time. Um, but he always tries to connect us with the Buddha as our teacher. And I think this is just so fantastic because he's opened up my understanding of the suttas in a way that wasn't possible just by reading the suttas myself. Um, it wasn't even possible just from listening to talks from other teachers who interpret the suttas. He goes right into the suttas and he recommends us to take the Buddha as our chief Kalyanamitta, our chief spiritual friend. And that's really helpful, not only in feeling a connection with the Buddha, but having more of a clear idea about whether our teachers are actually practicing properly, whether what they're teaching is in line with the Buddha's own teachings, with the Buddha's own insights. Yeah? Because everybody has some kind of, you know, exciting or like mind blowing blowing or <laughs> relatively nice experience in meditation at some point but if you don't have the map you can mistake that for something it's not and you see even senior teachers doing this even senior monastics do this you know they start talking about things being permanent permanent when we know they're not permanent from the suttas and from other teachers we've met so it's really helpful because it gives you that independence also of discernment when you have a little bit of understanding. And I guess that's one reason I wanted to do this uh, sort of class, because I think a good teacher will not want you to believe them straight out. They won't want you to be too dependent. They'll want to point you to, to the Buddha's teachings, mm, ultimately. So yeah, hope that helps. <laughs> uh, Maxwell has got a question as well. Yes. Um, yeah, I hope. Hi. Yeah, hi. Um, I hope this is a, a, appropriate. Um, but while we were talking about all these things, mm -hmm. what came into mind was how how we must never judge. Mm -hmm. And this was brought to me. In fact, as a as a medical student, we had to do so many deliveries of births. And the first two deliveries were absolutely amazing. However, when you were on the inside, the first lady wanted to deliver so well because she couldn't wait for this gorgeous being mm -hmm. that she was going to produce. Now, the second lady couldn't get rid of the this so-and-so being fast enough. Now, they both ended up with fantastic births, uh -huh. but the first one was wonderful and the second one was almost diabolical in her thinking. Mm. Had it been on the outside and not known that, I'd have thought two wonderful people. And so that sort of taught me in a way um, how wrong you can go if you do judge people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We don't uh, ever really know where someone's coming from. Mm, mm -hmm. mm, mm. So that, yes, I hope you didn't mind me bringing that up. No, no, not at all. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. and and. You know, on the one hand, it's surprising when somebody ends up sort of expressing something we didn't expect them to. And, you know, it, we might have expected something different. And on the other hand, even then, 
in another situation, they may not have said those things or the next month, they may completely change again or the next day even, they may completely change. Um, and I think, yeah, for myself, the more I meditate and see my mind and see how fickle it can be, you know, um, and how we so quickly change our perceptions of ourselves or others or where we are on the path or how our life is going. Um, it means that I'm less likely to kind of come up with a, 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 a kind of final perception of myself or of anyone else because I know how quickly those things change. And one of my first, te I think my very first teacher who was um, an assistant teacher to Goenkaji, but I had the good fortune to have a personal teacher because I used to go to the same retreat center every year for three or four months and he was a live-in teacher. So it was great. Madan Tulada, Nepali man. And uh, one of the things he told me was like, never ascribe intentions to another. I think they may be someone else's words, but it, that was the message. He said, never assume you know why they're doing what they're doing. Always ask, always inquire. Because <laughs> I was serving all these retreats, you know, and people would come and behave strangely and, you know, never sort of just say, you shouldn't be doing that. Or like, you know, that was blah, blah, blah. And especially going into what their intention might be because we just don't know. Um, even our own intentions, we have a sense that they're on the wholesome side or the unwholesome side, but it's mixed. It's usually mixed to some degree. It's like cans of paint. You get various shades between white and black, you know. You just get a little bit of black and it's kind of like, you think it's pure, but it's just a little bit gray or, yeah. I don't know, you can say the black one's pure and it gets polluted by the white paint, you know. And then it's not quite so, <laughs> so pure anymore. Mm. So yes, we can't judge. We really can't judge. It's very freeing, isn't it, to know that? Because my mind always likes to figure things out, like, oh, what's going on? Like, how does that work? It's like, oh, actually, I don't really know. <laughs> yeah. All right. I can see there's a lot of messages. I don't know if there are any um, questions in there, but I'm going to try to move on, I think. OK, yeah, someone had to leave. That's totally fine. I'm glad you could come. Where did we left? All right. So we still have half an hour and I'm wondering if you would like me to continue with some sutta reading because we do have one more sutta. It's, <laughs> it's about two pages. I can try and read it straight through without commenting or would you like me to comment? I'm never quite sure. Shall I just read it straight through? And then we'll speak at the end. Yeah, that way we'll finish it anyway. So this is from Samyutta Nikaya, chapter 55, which is the chapter on stream entrance, Subtapati Samyutta, I think, uh, number seven. And here it's called A Teaching Applicable to Oneself. This is very nice, actually. So I'll just say my comment right at the beginning, <laughs> because I read this earlier and I, I was struck by how it's actually an encouragement of empathy the whole way through the Buddha's asking us to stand in someone else's shoes. And I think this is so wonderful because I truly believe empathy has to be a part of compassion. Some teachers say compassion is different from empathy, but I think really it's just that empathy can either lead into compassion or it can lead to empathetic distress, but it, it should be a part of compassion for us to really understand an appropriate response. Mm. Otherwise, it's just too general, it's just too vague. So I love this because you can see that all the way through, he's asking us to reflect from the other person's perspective. So that's all the comment I shall make. So the householders of Bamboo Gate said to the Blessed One, please teach us the Dhamma in such a way that we might dwell happily at home and after death be reborn in a good destination in a heavenly world. I will teach you householders a Dhamma exposition applicable to oneself. Listen to that and attend closely, I will speak. Yes, sir, those Brahmin householders of Bamboo Gate replied. Then the Blessed One said this, what householders is the Dhamma exposition applicable to oneself? Here, householders, a noble disciple or anybody 
on the training, reflects thus. I am one who wishes to live, who does not wish to die. I desire happiness and am averse to suffering. Since I am one who wishes to live and does not wish to die, desires happiness and am averse to suffering, if someone were to take my life, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to me. Now, if I were to take the life of another, of one who wishes to live, who does not wish to die, who desires happiness and is averse to suffering, that would not be pleasable and please, pleasing and agreeable to the other. What is displeasing and disagreeable to me is displeasing and disagreeable to the other two. How can I inflict upon another what is displeasing and disagreeable to me? Having reflected thus, they abstain from the destruction of life, exhort others to abstain from the destruction of life, and speak in praise of abstinence from the destruction of life things. <laughs> Thus, this bodily conduct of theirs is purified in three respects. Again, householders, a noble disciple reflects thus. If someone were to take from me what I have not given, that is to commit theft, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to me. Now, if I were to take from another what they have not given, that is to commit theft, that would not be please, pleasing and agreeable to the other. What is displeasing and disagreeable to me is displeasing and disagreeable to the other two. How can I inflict upon another what is displeasing and disagreeable to me? Having reflected thus, one abstains from taking what is not given, exhorts others to abstain from taking what is not given, and speaks in praise of abstinence from taking what is not given. Thus, this bodily conduct of theirs is purified in three respects. Again, householders, a noble disciple reflects thus. If someone were to commit adultery with my wife or husband or anything else, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to me. Now, if I were to commit adultery with the partner of another, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to the other. What is displeasing and disagreeable to me is displeasing and disagreeable to the other too. How can I inflict upon another what is displeasing and disagreeable to me? Having reflected thus, one abstains from sexual misconduct, exhorts others to abstain from sexual misconduct and speaks in praise of abstinence from sexual misconduct. Thus, this bodily conduct of theirs is purified in three respects. Again, householders, a noble disciple reflects thus. If someone were to damage my welfare with false speech, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to me. Now, if I were to damage the welfare of another with false speech, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to the other. What is disagree displeasing and disagreeable to me is displeasing and disagreeable to the other two. How can I inflict upon another what is displeasing and disagreeable to me? Having reflected thus, they abstain from false speech, exhort others to abstain from false speech, and speak in praise of abstinence from false speech. Thus, this verbal conduct of theirs is purified in three respects. So then we go to some other aspects of speech. Again, householders, a noble disciple reflects thus. If someone were to divide me from my friends by divisive speech, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to me. Now, if I were to divide another from their friends by divisive speech, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to the other. Uh, then it does dot, dot, dot. How can I inflict upon another what is displeasing and disagreeable to me? Having reflected thus, they abstain from divisive speech, exhort others to abstain from divisive speech and speak in praise of the abstinence of divisive speech. Again, household as a noble disciple reflects thus, if someone were to address me with harsh speech, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to me. Now, if I were to address another with harsh speech, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to the other. And then it makes dot, dot, dot. By now, I think I will accept that. 
Thus, this verbal conduct of theirs is purified in three respects. And then the last type of long speech. Again, householders, a noble disciple reflects thus. If someone were to address me with frivolous speech and idle chatter, sometimes that's called gossip, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to me. Now, if I were to address another with frivolous speech and idle chatter, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to the other. What is displeasing and disagreeable to me is displeasing and disagreeable to the other too. How can I inflict upon another what is displeasing and disagreeable to me? Having reflected thus, they themselves abstain from idle chatter, exhort others to abstain from idle chatter, and speak in praise of the abstinence of, from idle chatter. Thus, this verbal conduct of theirs is purified in three respects. It's very nice. <laughs> so... It's really great, isn't it? So it's the empathy and the putting yourself in the other's shoes, but also really taking time to reflect. So it's not like your behavior is just default. You actually sit around and think about things and reflect and program your mind in that sense, right? It's like you condition your mind to think carefully about things. And then of course it has a lot more power. It has a lot more, um, yeah, right view again, basically. We're developing right view, right? Using thought at this stage, but also a little bit of inference and empathy and thinking how it feels for us. And I was thinking earlier that you could apply this same principles to absolutely anything, you know. If I were to be marginalized, you know, if I were, say, a trans person or anybody who's sort of on the edge, like a bikuni, <laughs> who doesn't have a full sangha, <laughs> who's on their own. Um, it would be, yeah, it, it would harm me, it would hurt, right? If I was marginalized, how would it feel? So therefore other people don't want to feel marginalized either. Other people also want to feel represented. Other people also want to feel included. So we can really use this sort of formula um, for many, many things. And the other thing I find very beautiful here is that we reflect and then abstain, but that doesn't stop there because we really understand why we're able to, probably because of that reflection that somebody's bothered to do, they're able to exhort others to abstain and not just by preaching, but with good reason, right? They're actually able to say why others should abstain, you know, because it harms others and then speak in praise of the right conduct of the abstaining from harmful actions. So it's very beautiful. You encourage them not to say, kill the peaceful protesters on the streets of Myanmar, right? I mean, I don't know who can encourage them, but obviously they're not being encouraged. And you can see the problem when they are encouraged. Uh, terrible. So we encourage them to abstain and then also speak in praise of the abstinence. So speaking praise of peace, speaking praise of harmony, of non-killing. So I can see two hands up and I want to come to both of you. Can we come to Min, I think, who had their hand up first and then we'll be coming Hello, close Anna. to the end. Hi. Yes, hi. I'll be Hello. Uh, no, please take your time. Yeah. Um, so having actually returned uh, from Myanmar a bit earlier than expected um, about a month ago, um, I think that, you know, yeah, yeah, this uh, sort of pre speaking in praise of absence of destruction of life and exhorting others to abstain from the destruction of life, I think from one direction um, is relatively straightforward. Mm. But uh, I do find sometimes it's very, very difficult for me to um, praise the same qualities when it comes to the peaceful protesters suddenly not being peaceful um, in some cases um, mm. partly because of peer pressure um, and partly because you know um, yeah it could have real sort of consequences um, on my on my role and also how my family is perceived etc if we if we were saying if we were to say publicly for example, um, that violence, as, as Ajahn Brahmari said earlier, uh, earlier today, that violence, you know, who, whichever side it's, uh, it is 
yeah, whichever side perpetrates the violence is actually mm-hmm. wrong. Um, mm-hmm. But in a very sort of, let's say, polarized situation that one sees there, you know, it seems to be okay <laughs> if, if one side is um, committing violence, but not okay if the other side is. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. Do you have any advice on how one might deal with it? It's really difficult. I mean, I I guess my first thought is, again, we can't judge because we don't know what sort of stress anybody's from. We do not know how we'd be in that situation. I have no idea, you know, and I'm a non-committed to non-violence at the cost of my life in theory. What would happen if somebody was attacking me? I really don't know. You know, I would like to think that I would remain non-violent. But then there's also the aspect of self-defense, which Ajahn Brahmali didn't go into today. Um, I do think that's different. I mean, I still wouldn't sort of propose that people start to beat up the ones who are beating them up if if there's another way. <laughs> but it is very different because you actually your motivation is not hatred of the other, it's protection of yourself. So the motivation is quite different. So it's tricky. Um, obviously, whatever the protesters do you know any any sort of violence that's happening there is it, it really is the minority of people there's such a strong commitment to non-violence and and more than that i mean extreme courage extreme commitment to that and it's just i think inspiring the world it's just incredible to see something like this in the modern day you know um i mean even in mahatma gandhi's time with the non-violence i don't think there were they had the whole military of the country against them with machine guns, you know, and now like these fighter planes that they're dropping bombs with. So it's very difficult, I would say, to judge. And I think it's important to see that it's the minority of people if they're becoming at all violent. I can understand why they might start thinking that way, but I agree with Ajahn Brahmali that it will be sort of the beginning of the end because the respect that they're harnessing from the international community is through their nonviolence. And I think that's what's going to bring people on board to support the cause. So I don't know what you do at that point, whether, you know, if you're afraid that you're going to move into violence, maybe it is time for you to get off the street. And, and I mean, unfortunately, there's nowhere really safe for the people to go. But if there's somewhere safe for them to go, try to de-escalate a little bit, you know, because the thing is the Myanmar people are going to start to be traumatized. I mean, they're already traumatized over years and years of a dictatorship, but they're going to have acute trauma. And once that happens, people can't think straight anymore. You know, I mean, that's partly how they make the military do what they do. They actually starve them. They give them amphetamines or (laughs) morphine or whatever, and then they give them orders. And it's not human nature to go out and kill. So I'm not sure if that's really actually answering what you asked because I wasn't absolutely clear. Would you like to come back on anything there? Is any of that at all helpful or off track? Yeah, no, I think that's that's helpful. Thank you very much, Venerable. Okay. I mean, I really empathize so much with the Myanmar people as far as I can possibly put myself in their shoes. I've lived in that country. You know, I was nurtured in my early spiritual life right from the beginning, actually, you know, because the lineage was from Myanmar. And I just know it as such a peaceful and truth-loving culture, such gentle people. It's very heartbreaking. And uh, I don't think anyone can judge. I think we've got to think as a global community what we can do to help. You know, Because how can we imagine what it'd be like to live under that? It's unlivable. It's not sustainable. Mm. Okay, one more. I'll unmute Emma. Hello. Hi, Emma. Hi, yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could explain um, what frivolous speech and idle chatter refer to. Um, yeah. But- as a, like a lay person, as someone who goes to work, has family, does things with everyday things, and you know, um, we can chat about anything, events in the world, yeah. blah blah blah. Um, not every conversation we have is like an in depth, um, of course, you know, conversation. Um, 
so what what does it mean really <laughs> yeah 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 well the first thing i say there is that going by the formulation here the reflection that the Buddha is asking us to do is like what is displeasing and disagreeable to me is displeasing and disagreeable to the other two hmm. so if you both consented to that kind of speech it's probably not disagreeable to either of you so then it already wouldn't necessarily fulfill that criteria because it's not yeah. actually something that you're just you know I mean to me this implies that you're just offloading on somebody right it's really disagreeable it's wasting their time it's kind of you know I don't know bringing their mind down to a sort of very like gross or coarse level um, mainly I'd say it's about wasting people's time there's another sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, I always go for this one, but there's a lot of them. Majjhima 51, it's one on the gradual training. Um, and it gives a bit more detail about the opposite of um, that kind of speech. And the opposite is things like words that go to the heart, words that are worth recording, words that kind of bring some happiness, some uplift. And I think sometimes a bit of, not necessarily, not gossip, because that tends to be a bit like mean against someone else, but a bit of lighthearted chat can be uplifting, can actually go to the heart, can create a, a nice, friendly, amiable kind of conducive vibe. And Ajahn Brahm does that all the time. You know, in monasteries, we don't only talk about deep stuff. At tea time, you know, lay people aren't allowed up into the monks or the nuns areas because they just talk general chit chat <laughs> because all day you know as a monastic this is what I don't get because I'm on my own and I'm always in a role I'm always teaching or else I'm on my own I don't have companions but for most monastics when they have a community they have this safe space where they can just let down their hair so to speak <laughs> they haven't got much but you know if they had it they'd be letting it down um, <laughs> they let down their robe, so they just wear, you know, like casual. They're not all dressed up with their full robe or whatever. And they have their tea and they just relax. And that's so important. And I think it's very humbling too, because otherwise you can get a bit of a inflated sense of who you are, you know. And monastics or lay people, we're just people. We're actually not very different. The difference is the renunciation, the depth of renunciation and letting go. But other than that, and that's a certain type of renunciation, right? Because there's other ways to renounce. Like, I mean, lay people might have, everyone has to renounce, for example, their nearest and dearest someday. Right? Some of you have gone through things I've not yet gone through that I don't know if I could survive. So we're just human beings. And uh, it's important to have a little bit of amiable talk, but at some point you might find it's just draining and it's like, you're not really consenting to it. It's just kind of someone's going on, someone's uploading. And then you can say, okay, well, you don't have to stop them. You might want to stop them, but you can just reflect, how did that feel for me? Oh, it wasn't very pleasant. Therefore I won't do that to another. Hmm? But if they're enjoying your conversation, then I don't think that really applies. Yeah. yeah. So long as it's not, you know, you have to watch yourself, don't you? You have to watch your mind. And speech is the hardest of all the precepts. It's the subtlest because it can very easily start to sort of degenerate. And I think after a while, it always does. If you're having a long conversation, it starts off kind of inspiring. And towards the end, you're just speaking because you kind of, you're on a roll, but actually you've nothing much more to say. So it might be around that as well, just noticing when it's not really serving its purpose anymore. Yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> These things are never meant to be judgments. So, you know, I'd say generally not to take things absolutely literally, but to look at the underlying reason behind it. And usually it's a matter of whether it's for one's benefit and harm and the benefit and harm of another. Okay, it seems we've come to the end in a very punctual way. And I hope that was of interest. There was some learning, there was some food for thought, food for contemplation. And next time you can tell me what the three cracks in the egg were, because even I got that mixed up earlier. <laughs> about the, because it looked like the same one. Sometimes I can't really digest all that text at once and make it out. So you can tell me what the Buddha's three breakthroughs were. I think it must be in the 
Maria Pariasana Sutta, maybe? I think if you Google it, you can find it. I think Derek and Amina might know also where it is. So don't just look sheepish. <laughs> Shh. If you know, you can put it in the chat box. If you don't know, you can pretend you don't know. No, that doesn't work. If you know, you can pretend you don't know. Anyway, this is what happens to speech when we speak too long. So, um, so next week, uh, we're actually starting a new chapter. We finished the first chapter, which is amazing. I'm quite pleased about that. We got through much more than a paragraph today. And next week, we're starting the chapter on personal training. So it's very beautifully uh, sequenced because the path starts with right view, but then what do we do with that right view? How do we put that into practice and actually start to train our mind? So if you have the book, you might feel like reading the introduction to the next section because Bhikkhu Bodhi's introductions are very insightful and they give an overview of the chapter. And then yes, it starts with generosity next week. So please be generous and turn up to my session because the more of you that are here, the happier I get. So, <laughs> so that's your generosity practice next year, next week, not next year, next week. Okay. <laughs> Lovely to see you all. Oh, I think I'm supposed to invite um, somebody to say a few words at the end. Yes, please don't go because I always forget this and uh, and they've practiced, you know, and they've put their heart into this. So <laughs> yeah. just two more minutes. I'm sure I speak for everyone here when I thank Venerable Chanda for her deep and inspiring delving into the Dhamma, especially the Kalama Sutta is one of my most liked ones. This session, like all others, Venerable Chanda provides purely out of her compassion and with meta for everyone. And if you feel like and are in a position to do, please consider making a donation towards supporting Venerable Chanda and her work and the Anukampa project to finally establish the first Bikuni monastery in the United Kingdom. Um, you can find out more about this project and how to donate at the Anokampa website and the Dana donation link is also in the chat box. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gunther. Yeah, you might need to be in the chat box again because I think it's probably quite far up. So if you just pop it back in the chat box. Thank you so much. It, it, I don't know, when you said the first Bikuni Monastery in the UK, Maybe it was your voice or the, the word the UK, but it sounded like, whoo, that's kind of a big deal, isn't it? I don't know. It just sounded really official. It made me quite excited. <laughs> so thank you for that. It's interesting to hear how people express it and they're, oh, they're talking about me, like they're talking about this project. Wow, we're doing the first Bikini Monastery in the UK. Wow, it's kind of intense. Great. Now I'm just checking because um, Tom Jenny, <laughs> Jenny Jenny, has her hand up. Is that intentional or unintentional? So this might not be the point to ask you this, um, but I'm coming back to Buddhism after quite a long time because um, I think it's, um, are you open to, I guess my question is, I've got a few questions coming back to it. Uh, <laughs> uh, are you a person who would talk to me about that? And if so, when? I am definitely a person who would talk to you about that, but I'm also okay. a person who doesn't have time outside of these yeah. sessions, I'm afraid, at the moment. Okay. And um, I spoke to Ajahn Brown about this the other day because I always say yes to everybody. And he said, you have to tell them that your teacher <laughs> says no, because <laughs> well, there will not be yeah. a venerable chanda if you say yes to everybody. <laughs> so yeah, although at this moment I feel like I'm quite busy, um, just keep coming to these sessions and we'll see how it goes and there might be a time that we can have a few minutes at the end for example you know, yeah so I guess feeling that, energetic yeah. uh, I uh, I'm certainly feeling patient that's absolutely fine I'd like to come again I thought that really resounded with me about what you said uh, yeah like when you feel like you've got the mental space or time I'd really appreciate it because um, I think it would yeah 
I just, I just think it's a conversation I'd like to have with somebody, mm. if that makes sense. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, can't, I don't, I've got to be vague because it's a, it's, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's yeah. about traditions yeah. that are local to me and things that have happened. So I just kind of. Okay. Okay. I tell you, sense? drop, drop an email to the team at, and then when I get a chance, we can talk. It just might be a few weeks. But if you drop an email, you know, with your name to the team at, can you put that in the chat box somewhere? Team at anucamperproject.org, then um, we'll find some time. Okay. But generally speaking, yeah, just, just so that I kind of have some boundary that I don't generally do personal conversations because it would just consume every last half hour of meditation that I actually managed to get at this stage in the project. But this is one reason we need a monastery because the other advantage of a monastery is that when you have monastics who are based in a place, you can have an ongoing relationship with them. They're not a teacher who's just coming in and out of your life. There's a place where you can go and you can have a relationship. And I think this is very different from, you know, just hearing talks online or, or going to this retreat and that retreat, but then that's it. So even if it's not often, even if you only come to the monastery once a month or once every six months, there the becomes a kind of sense of community and that's very supportive. It's not only with the teacher or the monastics, it's with the whole community. So let's, let's make that happen for everyone's well-being. <laughs> Good. So thank you for sticking around and let's unmute you. We'll stop the recording.